We'll begin with a brief overview of PMC, the company I work for, and Siemens PLM Technomatics plant simulation product. Next, we'll show you how six add-on libraries and special features can potentially help you to slash the time necessary to create a plant simulation model of your facility, as well as helping you to visualize, analyze, and optimize it. Finally, before we take questions, we'll wrap it all up with showing off plant simulation's newest major features and some helpful tips. For those of you who might not already know, discrete event tools like plant simulation let you analyze the operation of, a, of an entire department or facility and optimize overall items like throughput, buffer or inventory sizes, workers, and scheduling. Discrete event simulations are also often referred to as throughput simulation. Plant simulation is overflowing with useful features, but I'd like to point out three of its unique key features. Object orientation provides intuitive use of powerful built-in and custom-made objects that let you build models quicker. Hierarchy lets you structure complex models in an intuitive manner. It also makes it easier for you to make changes without having to tediously rearrange things like other flat structured products require. Inheritance lets you make changes in one place. All children are changed accordingly. This ensures quality and saves you a lot of time. I'm a past user of several other simulation tools that do not have these features. I'm not a salesperson, but a hands-on user. So I personally have found these features to be so powerful and useful that I would not want to go backwards to those other tools. PlantSim's Library Manager is an extremely nice, unique feature that lets you easily add or subtract objects for modeling, analysis, interfacing, etc., to or from PlantSim's class library that contains the set of tools that are available and visible in PlantSim. There are two tabs in the Manager. The Basic Objects tab displays all the default basic objects that are available off the shelf in PlantSim, as well as numerous others that can be added at the click of a mouse. The fact that you can have such fine control over the toolkit for your copy of PlantSim proves how PlantSim was built from the ground up in an object-oriented manner. Similarly, the Libraries tab lets you add or delete tools, free or licensed standard libraries, and additional libraries from third parties or yourself. And you'll see some of those in this presentation. Our next topic covers several libraries that you may find useful. We'll start with energy efficiency optimization. Energy pain points include rising energy consumption and cost. Also, green is in with consumers and regulators. Additionally, green certifications like the Energy Star seal and EPA regulations and mandates are becoming more important. The solution to these problems has two ingredients. First, dynamic simulation modeling of systems using a tool such as Siemens Technomatics plant simulation software provides a powerful virtual environment to test and improve a system design and operations to address traditional optimization issues such as maximizing throughput, minimizing inventories and buffers, and minimizing labor. Second, while plant simulation always provided a powerful engine to build, analyze, and optimize your processes, the new energy features that were added to PlantSim recently now let you simulate energy consumption and analyze and optimize energy efficiency. Note, the new energy features are incorporated into the base plant simulation product as can be seen in the new energy tab that's added to the other input-output tabs for standard plant sim objects that model stations, machines, conveyors, etc. So they are not really an add-on library, but we are covering these features here since they are so unique and very useful. And now we have a video of an energy simulation of an LCD TV flat screen production facility. We'll start with a screen tour of our plant simulation model. The source, 
put skids on the conveyor to the right, which moves skids up to the main assembly line. The main board is placed on the skid at station A1. The display panel is added at station AS3. Other parts are added further down the assembly line. And then the panel goes through quality, localize, inspection, packaging, and labeling processes before being removed from the skid and transferred to the finished product drain where throughput statistics are collected and displayed. Using Plant Simulation's powerful traditional modeling and analysis tools, the existing model was optimized for a maximum throughput of 1,976 screens per day. What if experiments also showed that a minimum of 80 skids was required to maintain that throughput? Since Plant Simulation now can model, analyze, and optimize energy consumption, we set new goals for our plant to reduce energy consumption without decreasing throughput. The first step is to specify power inputs in kilowatts in the energy tab of the stations for all its states, including working, setting up, operational, fail, standby, and off. We also specify the transition times between states. Now we'll run the model for one simulated day. We'll run the model slow for a while so you can see everything in action starting with the first skid being placed on the main line and throughput statistics being collected when the screens are removed from the skids after the packaging line. After one day of simulated time, you can see that our throughput is the optimized value of 1,976 screens that was mentioned before. Since we added energy inputs for our stations and conveyors, the Energy Analyzer's display panel also provides valuable overall statistics including 1,899.7 total kilowatt hours of energy consumed. Let's take a look at the Energy Analyzer Show Visualization option. The stations surrounded by solid red circles are the ones that consume the most energy. Hollow red circles indicate the next largest energy consumers. Blue indicates the least energy consumers. And purple is in between. This visualization lets you quickly identify areas where you may want to focus on making potential individual energy improvements. This is similar to using PlantSim's bottleneck analyzer to help you to identify the main throughput bottlenecks. Instead of diving into individual station details, let's take a look at the Energy Analyzer Show Plotter option. This shows kilowatt consumption at any given time. As you can see, from midnight until the start of the one shift we are working at 8 o'clock in the morning, all the stations and conveyors were in operational or waiting state and consumed approximately 77 kilowatts. Then at 8 o'clock, the equipment switched to working state and consumed about 85 kilowatts. During the 15-minute break at 9 o'clock, equipment switched back to operational. Then back to working state until lunchtime. During the 45-minute lunch break, the equipment switched back to operational. After lunch, we're back to working state. At 2 o'clock p.m., we're on a 15-minute break, so we're back to operational. Then back to work after the last break of the day. Then back to operational state from the end of the shift at 5.15 p.m. until the end of the day, since we are only working one shift. After looking at this chart, you may have guessed that we could save energy by switching to standby during breaks instead of leaving everything in the operational state. To do that in our model, all you have to do is check the on-screen Save Energy Standby During Breaks checkbox. Now, after running our model for one day, our Energy Analyzer's display panel shows that we've decreased total power consumption from 1,899.7 kilowatt hours to 1,820.9 kilowatt hours. This would result in a nice decrease in your energy bill over the years. Also, we achieve these savings without any decrease in throughput. Let's take another look at the Energy Analyzer Show Plotter option.
instead of being in the operational state consuming about 77 kilowatts during breaks, our equipment is now in standby state instead, consuming only about 14 kilowatts. After looking at this chart, you may have guessed that we could save even more energy by switching to the off state during off shift or unplanned time, instead of leaving everything in the operational state. Since these periods are long, we are switching to off state instead of standby for even more energy savings. To do that in our model, all you have to do is check the on-screen save energy off during night checkbox. Now, after running our model for one day, our energy analyzer's display panel shows that we've decreased total power consumption from 1,820.9 kilowatt hours to 819.1 kilowatt hours. And once again, we achieve these savings without any decrease in throughput. Let's take another look at the Energy Analyzer's Show Plotter option. As you can see, during off-shift or unplanned time, instead of consuming approximately 77 kilowatts, our equipment is consuming just about 8 kilowatts. And during breaks, instead of consuming approximately 77 kilowatts, our equipment is consuming about 14 kilowatts. The secret behind modeling these energy-saving measures is the State Transitions button on the Energy tab for our station and conveyor objects. The left side tells plants and what to do at the start and end of a pause or break within a shift. Here, standby is specified. The right side tells plants and what to do at the start and end of unplanned or off-shift time between shifts. Here, off-state is specified. And last but not least, the Power Up Early option lets you power up equipment early so that your equipment is ready and raring to go as soon as working time pops up, so you get no decrease in throughput. Now, if we look at the Energy Analyzer's Show Visualization option, we can see things have improved, but power supply stations 1 and 2 are still high energy consumers, as indicated by the solid red circles. If we look at the Energy Analyzer Show Chart option, you can see that the power supply area consumes a lot of energy while in the operational state. We can see the details by highlighting the area in the chart. The light green areas for power supply stations 1 and 2 show that these stations consume a lot more energy in the operation or wait state than the other stations. While one in the simulation, it appears that the power supply buffer is always full. A look at the buffers chart shows that it's almost always full with 150 power supplies. Every time a power supply leaves the buffer for the main line, the power supply line puts in one more unit, hence the near straight but jagged line. One potential energy optimization opportunity in this area would be to treat this buffer as a Kanban buffer where the power supply line feeds the buffer only after it reaches a lower level of contents. In our model, the Save Energy Power Supply checkbox sets the power supply lineup so that the buffer is filled at the start of the simulation and thereafter it's fed only after 50 units are left in the buffer. Now after running our model for one day, our Energy Analyzer's display panel shows that we've decreased total power consumption from 819.1 kilowatt hours to 755.9 kilowatt hours. And once again, we achieve these savings without any decrease in throughput. Finally, if we take another look at the Energy Analyzer's Show Visualization option, we can see things have improved dramatically in the power supply area. Instead of solid red circles indicating high energy consumption, power supply stations 1 and 2 are now purple, indicating a medium level. There is room for even more optimizations, but I hope you've seen enough to see how useful Plant Simulation's new energy optimization features can be. Okay, our next topic is the Warehousing and Logistics Library, which provides numerous objects that slash the time required to build, analyze, and optimize a warehouse model. Visualization includes informative 2D icons and realistic 3D icons. For example, the Warehousing and Logistics Library provides several storage objects that provide detailed modeling of various storage objects commonly found in warehouse. The first high-level storage object is the single deep rack. In the 2D view of your simulation, the single deep rack looks like this. And the 3D representation looks like this. 
Note, all rack objects can be quickly customized for the number of clusters or shelves across. Our example has three clusters, and the number of levels, our example has five levels, and the depth. You can even specify individual lengths for each cluster. Our example has equal lengths. And you can specify individual heights for each level. Our example has double the height for the first two levels at the bottom. As you can see for 3D, you can also change shelf and column dimensions and colors. The double deep rack is similar to the single deep rack, but is also two shelves deep. The pushback rack is designed for use with a deep reach fork truck. The flow rack is loaded at the back. Parts roll or flow to the front for picking. The drive-in rack allows forklifts to drive directly into the lane of stacked rows. And block stack stacking models inexpensive floor storage. The Warehousing and Logistics Library's Hotspot Analyzer is a really nice color-coded visualization of the amount of traffic on aisles, where blue is low traffic and red is high. This can help you to pinpoint areas to focus on for your what-if games, like changing traffic flow or where articles are stored. Our warehouse demo video shows how quickly you can create the layout of a warehouse model. You start building a model of your warehouse by specifying the overall dimensions of the warehouse, then the number, orientation, and length of aisles. Next, you specify the type of storage racks that are on the left and or right sides of an aisle and what type of rack you want. Then you specify how many docks you want and where to place them. Finally, you specify the staging area that defines where the forklifts move pallets to and from the docks. Instead of spending hours or days, after just a few minutes, we've done everything you need to do to model the physical aspects of our warehouse, details about where and what products will be stored initially, deliveries to and from the warehouse, etc., also need to be provided. This can be entered manually or imported from Excel. Before the simulation runs, the racks are initialized per your specifications. As you can see, the 2D visualization shows if racks are empty, full, or partially full. And you can see the forklifts delivering pallets to and from the docks. This is a crane's eye view as it moves in an aisle. As you can see, 3D is very detailed, down to the cartons stored on individual shelves, moving on the conveyor, or being transported by forklifts. Okay, I hope that gave you a good idea of, of the power of that library. Uh, the benefits of using the Warehousing and Logistics Library include reduced modeling time of warehouse and logistics operations by more than 90%. You can build warehouse models in minutes or hours instead of days. No programming knowledge required. But of course, you can still customize things with PlantSim's built-in objects, including methods that contain custom programming. PlantSim and the library include extensive what-if analysis options. The library also provides a high level of accuracy and realism. You've already seen how detailed and configurable objects like the racks are. Finally, the detailed 2D and 3D visualizations provide a powerful communications tool. Our next topic covers the food and beverage library and the new built-in fluid objects. To visualize and simulate your food and beverage process, the food and beverage library provides several industry-specific modeling objects. Two source objects include fluids and solids into the simulation according to a user-defined schedule. The tank object holds fluids. The stirrer tank is based on the tank, but also includes a processing time to simulate stirring. The mixer is a special tank that can process both liquids and solids and mixes them together. The filling object is another specialized tank that consumes liquids and produces solids that represent filled cases like bottles or filled molds. The diverter singularizes products that have been filled into forms by the filling object. The palletizing object loads products onto pallets. The storage objects store pallets. 
It optionally lets you directly enter truck orders according to delivery dates. Finally, there are several moving units which move through your process, including mass MU, produced by filling, piece, produced by the diverter, carton to put products in, pallets contain cartons, forklifts move pallets, and trucks make the deliveries. As you may know, discrete event simulation tools like PlantSim include features that let you analyze your facility, like locating bottlenecks and optimize it quickly and safely by playing what-if games that let you test proposed improvements on your computer. The food and beverage library adds to this already powerful arsenal of built-in powerful tools. Visualization of your process helps to understand and analyze your process by showing flows through pipes, tanks filling and emptying, etc. Bottlenecks like a tank being empty for too long can often be pinpointed by just looking at your simulation run. On-screen statistics can include overall data like total pallets produced and number of orders delayed as well as detailed statistics for individual objects like the contents and status of a tank and its maximum capacity and current capacity. Time and state graphs are a great way to pinpoint problem areas. For example, a station waiting for material for too long. Data tables like truck orders for a storage object let you see the details for every delivery, like the exact date and time. The scenario control lets you play what-if games by specifying different data sets for mixers and truck orders. PlantSim's built-in tools can also help to analyze and optimize your process, including the experiment manager that can automate the running of all the scenarios that were set up in the scenario control, as well as varying other parameters. The bottleneck analyzer can help you to pinpoint bottlenecks, and the sand key diagram lets you visualize the flow of fluids and solids. The thicker the line, the greater the flow. In the example shown, you can see that more cacao than sugar or milk powder flows into the mixer. Our next demo will quickly show you several of these objects in action. This video shows a plant sim model of a chocolate factory in action. As you can see, visualization is really nice. You can see raw materials flowing through pipes, tanks filling up and emptying, stirrers stirring, mixers mixing, the filler filling, the diverters sending in individual pieces to be wrapped, put in cartons, and cartons put on pallets, then stored and shipped. This screen summarizes the results of four what-if scenarios that were run. Throughput was boosted from 335 to 516 pallets per day. Okay, now, uh, as of Plant Simulation version 11 TR3, released shortly before uh, version 12, Plant Simulation now includes fluid objects that let you model food and beverage facilities without the separate food and beverage library that we just covered. As you can see in the example model shown, like the traditional non-fluid objects, the fluid objects like tanks, mixers, and pipes can be viewed in 2D and 3D with the same color coding of ingredients. Both the objects in the add-on library and the new built-in fluid objects model food and beverage facilities. Since each one has a different approach that different types of users may prefer, PMC still supports the add-on library. For example, plant simulation new fluid objects include a unique materials table shown at top where all base and intermediate ingredients and final products are specified, including their on-screen color coding in one central table that other objects like mixers refer to. While the food and beverage library's mixer object specifies ingredient details within that object, as shown in the mixer's end products table at bottom of this slide, if you decide to model your food and beverage facility with PlantSim, PNC can help you decide which approach to use. The cool thing is, is that you have a choice. PlantSim has several material handling objects, many that are not available in most other products. 
We'll show you several of them, including ones that are already in the default class library toolbox and others available in free libraries. The multiportal crane moves in three directions and can pick up a part from anywhere and move it anywhere. It can run on rails on the floor or on rails attached to the ceiling. Several cranes can run on one set of rails too, as shown here. Note, for tools that don't have this object, modeling one or more cranes can vary from relatively simple to difficult to nearly impossible. So black boxing the behavior of cranes could possibly result in inaccurate simulations, especially if they are the main bottleneck. This could lead to bad and or costly decisions. The same holds true for the modeling of a pick-and-place robot. The pick-and-place robot rotates to a station, picks up a part, then rotates to another station and places it in that station. In products that do not have this object, a simple pick-and-place movement can be modeled with a station object. This black boxing is okay statistically, but does not provide the visualization that is becoming more important for communicating to others how your facility works. And if there are several pick-and-place locations, then it's very difficult to model without this type of object. The turntable directly models the actions of a turntable, including time to move apart on and off, rotation time, and rotation angle. The turn plate is another unique object that is similar to the turntable, but more complex since it also ensures that the part is oriented as specified when the turn plate rotates to its destination. This is useful for modeling situations like ensuring that a barcode can be read by a scanner. The angular converter is another unique object that moves parts perpendicularly while maintaining the orientation of the part instead of rotating it as in a regular perpendicular move on a conveyor. It moves along its length in one direction and its width in the other direction. I recently had a project that had several of these on the plant floor, including different speeds to move in the two directions. Without this object, I would have had to resort to modeling tricks or make a custom object to simulate this. The converter is yet another unique object. The part either passes straight through in the conveying direction or is, for example, lifted onto a laterally moving transport level, then conveyed laterally to the left or right. The cross-sliding car is mainly used for moving parts from one conveyor to another. Parts enter from left or right, then move across an aisle, for example, and then exit on the left or right. Our next demo will quickly show you several of these objects in action. This short video shows off several of Plant Simulation's great material handling objects, including three portal cranes moving on two sets of rails, which deliver parts to stations that depend on what type of part it is and what the next station it needs to be processed in next. You can also see a pick-and-place robot, a turntable, a cross-sliding car, and an angular converter in action. Near the start of the simulation, you may have also noticed workers moving along a curved footpath at the bottom of the screen. Note that you can always open a 3D window at the click of the mouse and watch the action in 3D, too. Okay, our next topic is virtual commissioning. Setup and ramp up of the systems implementation for robotics and automation is called commissioning. Traditionally, this step is done after the physical system is built on the shop floor. Technomatics Virtual Commissioning lets you test and optimize commissioning during the planning and design phase instead of during setup and ramp up time in a virtual environment that takes into account equipment like robots, PLCs, conveyors, light barriers, etc., without any risk to the model facility. Doing this cuts typical setup and ramp up time from four to five weeks to one to one and a half weeks. In other words, time to job one is reduced and problems can be addressed before production starts. Besides being a very powerful 
generic discrete event simulation tool that can optimize an entire facility without including commissioning. Technomatics plant simulations virtual commissioning tools address overall factory issues. This ensures that the overall material flow and operation of a facility works smoothly with components like PLCs, conveyors, light barriers, etc. The OPC commissioning interface lets plant sims send and receive control logic signals to and from the PLCs. The photo shows a typical setup. On the left is the control panel for the PLC. On the right is the plant simulation model. This is an ideal setup since the PLC is not yet connected to the plant floor. So you can check out and tweak your control logic virtually before going live in the plant. One of my clients used this to check that the PLC control logic worked for their factory's conveyor system, which had numerous light sensors and stops along the way where parts would wait for certain conditions before moving on. They were especially concerned about an interesting pass problem where a standalone plant sim like discrete event simulation showed that their control logic worked. But when the plant was built, deadlock conditions occurred where everything was stuck. The problem was that the simulation implemented slightly different control logic, so the problem didn't occur in the simulation. Now they can interface PlantSim with the PLCs so that the exact control logic from the PLC controls the simulated stops on the conveyor to ensure accuracy. While plant simulation addresses overall uh, factory commissioning issues, process simulate addresses cell and line level issues. Besides being a very powerful generic tool that can optimize a work cell's robotics programming and ergonomics without including commissioning, Technomatics process simulates virtual, virtual commissioning tools, ensures that automation equipment like robots work smoothly with control comp components like PLCs. Our next topic, the Value Stream Mapping Library, lets you build, visualize, and analyze your process in Value Stream Mapping format that displays standard VMS icons. Our demo video will show how to use a plant sim's VSM model to optimize a process. I'll be showing you a demo of the VSM library that combines the static VSM methodology with the dynamic behavior of a Technomatics plant simulation model. We'll start with a quick tour of our Technomatics plant simulation value stream model of a simplified desk assembly plant. As you can see, the VSM library uses standard icons to represent suppliers, customers, transportation, inventory, and processes. The blue lines show material flow. Orange shows information flow. At the upper left, Supplier 2 provides the legs for our desks. Transport 2 below it moves 40 legs to Inventory 2. The number below shows how many legs are in stock. It's zero now because the simulation has not run yet. Supplier 1 provides the raw material for the desktops, which are made out of wood. Transport 1 moves 10 wood units to Inventory 1. Our assembly line starts with the Make Tabletop process, which removes wood from Inventory 1 and turns it into a tabletop. Next, Assemble Desk removes one tabletop from Inventory 3 and four legs from Inventory 2, then assembles them. Next, the Finish Desk process removes one desk from Inventory and stains the desk. Note, during a simulation run, the number below Finish Desk will show the total throughput so far. Also note that the on-screen display of other input and output parameters can be easily switched on and off by you. No programming required. The assembly line ends with Pack 5 Desks, which removes 5 desks from Inventory 4 and packs them up for shipment. Note that the number beneath Inventory 4 is 20. That was set with the initial stock optional input parameter. This lets us easily set up a plant's initial condition. Last but not least, Transport 4 moves the five desks to the customer who sends out orders and triggers production. Like everything else here, no programming is required to model this. Note, what you've seen so far is no different from a traditional static value stream map. The next slide will show how to use your value stream map 
to leverage the dynamic power of a technomatics plant simulation model to go beyond what a static VSM can do for you. This is our screen after simulating 10 24-hour days of production. Note that 6,781 desks were finished. This would probably be the first problem you would notice since it's far below expected production. Also note that a desk is currently being finished while another one is being assembled. You can tell from the icons in those two processes. After seeing these results, you would probably want to locate the main bottleneck. There are several analysis tools to help you do that, like the analyzer. One place to start is with the analyzer's relative occupation button. This tool gathers time and state percentages for all processes. In this case, one problem is obvious. The finished desk process is down or failed for a large percentage of time. You discover that the hotshot bean counter who got a promotion for saving money got what he paid for, a cheap machine which goes down 50% of the time. Before presenting your case to replace that piece of junk with the same type of perfect equipment as the other processes, you arm yourself with proof of what that can do. First, you spend about five seconds to change the availability of the finished desk process from 50% to 100% since your preferred supplier's machines are expensive but perfect. Your what-if game pays off. Throughput skyrocketed from 6,781 to 11,688 desks. When you present this to your management team, Mr. Hotshot suggests that buying a second cheapo machine will do the trick for less money. But you soon wipe that smirk off his face. How? By using your Technomatics 3D factory CAD model to show that another machine cannot fit in the building because a load-bearing post and a steam pipe are in the way. Worst of all, the coffee machine would have to go, too, for you to look for more improvements. So you take a look at the updated relative time chart. All that yellow waiting time represents room for improvement. Perhaps it's a supplier or transport issue. Or maybe you can get your customer to order more frequently. Or find another customer. Your VSM model makes it easy to try your ideas out on the computer before you invest in anything. One more thing you would probably notice. There are a lot of units in Inventory 1 and 2. A look inside the Inventory Over Time chart provides details. Obviously, there is plenty of room for improvement. We hope you enjoyed this story, and like all good stories, it has a happy ending. Everyone at your company, except the hotshot, lives happily ever after. Okay, now before we take questions, we'll take a look at the newest major plant simulation features and provide some helpful tips. Version 13 of Plant Simulation has a new 3D library with smart objects and improved 3D capabilities. This includes improved appearance of several modeling objects, including those shown here. Although most engineers and analysts only require 2D to analyze and optimize a facility model with Plant Simulation, 3D is getting more popular for communications purposes especially for presentations to managers and executives. So these 3D improvements can be very helpful. If the new default 3D graphics are not close enough to the equipment at your location, they can be easily replaced by importing 3D graphic files in several formats used by the major 3D CAD tools, including JT and STEP files. Version 13 of Plant Simulation has a great new worker option. The option to have a worker walk freely within an area instead of along a fixed path, footpath objects. Before we show this, we'll review Plant Sim's very powerful set of other worker options that many other discrete event simulation tools do not have. The simplest way to model a worker is to use the Work Remotely option that allows a worker to work from the worker pool object that creates workers when the model is initialized. If worker travel times are very short compared to the cycle time of the stations, like the single proc shown here, and you don't mind not seeing the worker working right at the station, this option can be quick and useful. Note, in 2D, the worker is color-coded as shown at the top Blue indicates that the worker is not working. 
As shown at the bottom, green indicates that the worker is currently working at a station like the single proc that is also working, indicated by the green dot above the single proc icon in 2D, which is on the left side above, and 3D, which is on the right side. Like the work remotely option, the beam to option does not model walking time, but it shows the worker working at a workplace object that can be positioned anywhere on the screen. Normally, you put that close to a station like the single proc shown. This is useful in cases where it is not important to model walking time, but you want nice visualization. However, you have a bit more work to do since you have to put a workplace object near the station. Here the workplace is color-coded, blue for not working and green for working. If no worker is present, the workplace is colored gray. You also have the option of having the worker beam to another station if not working or to stay at the station. The walk-along footpath option lets you model the time it takes for a worker to walk from one place to another. In 3D, shown at right, the worker's legs move while walking along the gray colored footpath to do work at single procs one and two. Another powerful option is the ability to have a worker carry a part from one station to another. In both 2D and 3D, the part appears in the hands of the worker. The new Move Freely option lets the worker move freely instead of along a footpath object. The worker automatically takes the shortest path from one workplace to another unless there is an obstacle in the way, like a pillar or a pick-and-place robot. In that case, the worker automatically walks around the obstacle. The new Barred Area option on the 3D Edit tab of the ribbon bar lets you create an obstacle that is round, rectangular, or rectangular with hatching. Besides barred areas, any modeling object can be specified as an obstacle in the Obstacle for Worker option in the Graphics tab of the Edit 3D Properties dialog. If none is specified, then the worker can walk right through the object instead of around it. We have a really cool short demo that shows a worker moving freely around obstacles. This video shows off plant simulations worker carrying a part and worker moving freely options in action. Plant Sim's event controller has been slowed down so you can see the details, like the worker's legs moving while walking. As you can see, here one worker works at three stations during their cycle times and also carries finished magenta colored parts from station to station. Note that similar to many stations in modern factories, the single proc object that represents the stations have colored coded lights. Green means the station is working, yellow means work is done, and that the part is waiting to be moved to the next station. Orange means the station is waiting for a worker. As you can see, the worker automatically takes the shortest path between stations and walks around the two obstacles. In this case, the obstacles are a pick-and-place robot's work perimeter and a barrier indicated by the red-colored hatched rectangle. In conclusion, being able to work freely instead of along a specified footpath is a new, unique, powerful feature that provides you with yet another way to quickly model workers. Other new plant simulation features from versions 13 and 12 of plant simulation include a new user interface which now matches the standard theme for other Siemens PLM products. 3D fences, stairs, and racks can now be added from the insert shape area of the 3D edit tab of the ribbon bar. Point clouds can now be imported into the 3D scene via the point cloud tab of the 3D properties dialog of the 3D frame. This allows a highly detailed laser scan 3D layout of your facility to be displayed. And modeling objects can then be optionally positioned in their exact 3D locations using the point cloud as a guide. A new deportioner converts these discrete event parts to fluids. This complements the portioner, which does the opposite. The new sensors on tanks let you know when the amount of material has exceeded or under, uh, 
run the custom sensor lever. This lets you trigger other appropriate actions when these events occur. A new version of Plant Simulation's programming language called SimTalk2 was added. Its syntax makes custom programming faster and easier. Note that you can freely mix one and two syntax so all your old programming methods will run fine. Numerous other improvements and enhancements were made. Uh, refer to Plant Sim's What's New section of the Help dialog for further information. I added a little bonus here, a few tips that you may find useful. First, in general, don't recreate the wheel. Among the features that make PlantSim my favorite tool is that it's easy to make your own custom objects and that the programming language is extremely powerful. But before you make a custom object from scratch, make sure there is no default PlantSim object like the pick and place robot no free object in the library manager, like the portal crane, or no object in a license library that already does the job. But in some cases, you may still want to make your own object. For example, if you have to pay for a library, and if you have the time and inclination, you may decide to make your own objects. Ditto if you only need one or two objects, but don't want to pay for dozens that you will never use in a library. Also, if an object does most of what you need, instead of building an object from scratch, you may want to customize that object. PlantSim makes it really easy to do that. This could save you a lot of time. Third, in general, you should write custom programming only when a built-in feature like a specific exit strategy is not available. So always double check since PlantSim has so many features that you can be easily overlooked. However, if you're a nerd like me, you may not be able to resist the urge to program, especially if it does something only a geek could love, like saving a few bits, bytes, or CPU clock cycles. Fourth, if you are modeling workers and the worker chart is not in your class library, add it from the library manager. This chart is an invaluable way to quickly analyze the utilization of workers, either individually or as part of a group of workers. Finally, don't take any wooden nickels or simulation tools that don't have all the features that you need. One final note. This slide shows the average return on investment experienced by 600 plant simulation users in a wide variety of industries. Results include a 12 to 1 average value cost ratio. I've witnessed this kind of return on investment in projects that I've been involved in. Thank you.